Morning, Brookdale. Could I ask all the folks who are in the lobby to please come on in? We're getting ready to worship our Lord. So welcome to all of you who are here. Welcome to all of you who are watching online. Before we do anything else, may I ask you to please bow your head, close your eyes, and let's pray to our God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for just this life. We thank you for this beautiful day that you're bringing to us. We even thank you for all the rain. Lord, we thank you for everything, because without you, there would be nothing. Without you, we would be left to our own devices. Without the, your son that you sent to save us, we would be lost. But we are not. We who know your son, Jesus Christ, as our Savior, God, and Lord, we are not lost. We are found, and we will have an eternity of bliss with you. So, Lord, we ask your spirit to be with us today. Uh, to be with us with our guest preacher, Pastor Doug, and to uh, just fill us up so that when we leave this place, we go back into the world knowing that we're not of it any longer, but back into the world to spread the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, in both word and deed. And we pray for your guidance and the guidance of your spirit in all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'd ask you all to please stand and open your hymnals to number 104. Thanks. And as we stand together and sing, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 5. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Let's sing together. song open up the heavens let's play that track John
Thank you, Lord. We want to praise you today. We are looking for you to do great things in our lives because we trust in you. So open up the heavens, Lord. We want to praise you and lift you high today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Before we do anything else, we ask you, you don't have to get up, but you can if you want to, and just get up and sit, wave to everybody near you and wish them a beautiful day in the Lord. And it is a beautiful day. Every day is a beautiful day in the Lord. And by the way, he is still risen. Amen? Amen. Well, we have a guest preacher today, and... Uh, that's why I'm doing the announcements as the service host. But uh, I'll be introducing him to you uh, before he comes up to preach to us from the Word of God. Some announcements first. We are going to have a class for those uh, who uh, would like to be baptized, who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but have not yet as commanded us by God have not yet been baptized through by immersion so that uh, the symbolism is so obvious so it needs to be done so if you know the Lord and you want to be baptized please let us know we're going to have uh, a class for that uh, on April the 20th which is this coming Saturday morning uh, the baptism will take place on April the 21st okay so also, if you're baptized and you're over a certain age, 18, uh, you become a member of the church also, but that's a separate part. If you are already saved and baptized, uh, then we ask you, you can, and you're not a member, the membership brings with us a lot of things, most important of which you take part in our annual meeting. So if you're baptized, if you're saved and baptized but not a member, but please then come to the same class. It's going to be in the white building right over here, and it's going to be on Saturday morning at 10 a.m., this coming Saturday morning, April 20th. So for all those who would like to be baptized and all those who already are but would like to become members, please let us know and please show up. Um, or let the in, if, uh, welcome desk know or call our church office, 973 338 eight five three six oh and if you cannot attend either the bap the baptism and or membership class on the 20th uh just let us know and i'll accommodate your schedule okay we'll juggle things around so that you can do those things thank you um, our youth ministry and by the way you'll see some flyers out on the welcome desk about um, what we're talking about about our youth ministry um, on Saturday, April the 27th, between 1 and 3.30 p.m. in our gym, that's on the corner building, uh, we're going to have uh, something sponsored by Word of Life Fellowship and Seven Admirals, and they will be presenting the rally. It's a video game tournament open to all teens with snacks, prizes, and, of course, a gospel message. And uh, secondly... But something we all, even if we're not teenagers, can participate in starting next Sunday. Um, and no, starting this Sunday, right? Yeah, starting this Sunday, April 14th. And ending three weeks later on Sunday, May the 5th, our youth group, Forge, will be collecting certain basic food items to send to a Christian ministry in the Dominican Republic that delivers Bibles and food to regions impoverished both physically and spiritually. So on the welcome desk is a list of the items that Forge is collecting. We ask you to please pick them up and please help. We could use the help. We could use the help not only to feed the bodies of those people in those regions, but especially to distribute Bibles, the word of God, so that their souls are nourished also. Uh, also, uh, uh, when you're leaving, please pick up a prayer list for April that was prepared by our Elder Horace Preddy. You'll find that on the welcome desk also. And if you are a participant in our Christian Book Club, which will meet again on May the 5th, 
and you have not yet purchased your copy of The Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, we have a beautiful hardcover annotated edition. Uh, we were going to get paperback, so the purchase price for the paperbacks is $9, and that's what you'll be asked to give, $9. But because of uh, supply chain problems in our country, we didn't have enough paperbacks to buy. So we bought this other very nice, beautiful hardcover keepsake that you can put on your bookshelves, and that cost us $20. But that's not, wouldn't be fair to ask you to pay the $20 because of problems in our economy. So we are asking you to consider, if you want to, paying the nine, which you should be paying, which is the fair price, but if you want to contribute a little to the mistake made by our economic masters, please feel free to do so. Now I'd ask the ushers to please come forward to collect our tithes and offerings, and I'd ask all of you to please bow your heads and close your eyes and pray with me for these purposes. Lord, accept our prayers for Charlotte Rochella. Uh, she's the wife of our beloved Vincent, the mother of our beloved Matt, the mother-in-law of our beloved Adeline, the grandmother of our beloved Tommy. Lord, you, she's been ill for a long time, and we ask you to just, just fill her with your blessings. Watch over her, guide her, and uh, let her know that you are there with her. And Lord, we also pray for your mercy and your healing and your peace for our beloved sisters and brother, for Jackie Meisch, for Carol Lockhart, Elaine Minieri, Velmore Nelson, Angel Velez, who's Adeline's father, and for Jasmine Gabriel, who uh, has just returned from the hospital. There are also many others, Lord, as you know, who have had operations or are going through operations or are going through hard times, but have asked not to have their names mentioned, but you know who they are, Lord, and we lift our prayers to you for, for all of those. And Lord, uh, we ask for your comfort and we pray to you for the people of Israel who have been attacked unexpectedly by another country. Uh, there have been no casualties so far and let us pray that there are none. And Father, we pray for our tithes and offerings which we gladly give in obedience to your commands we pray that these tithes and these offerings will be acceptable to you. And finally, Lord, we pray that your spirit just fill up our guest preacher today, Pastor Doug, as he brings to us a message from your word to us. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior, God and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. friend and I have lived in 
you today that whatever we're going through, we know that you are a good God. You are a faithful Father, and you've been closer to us just like a friend in need, and for those that come around and help those in need around us. Lord, we thank you for your love and your devotion to us, and may we be devoted to you as we continue today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. And now we, it's time for our kids' time. So all our young children, please come up here. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. You can sit wherever you want. It's okay. If you want to sit up there, that's okay. That's okay. No one's going to holler at you. Uh, Good morning. How you doing today? Good? Yeah? Yeah? All right. I always start with questions, so I have a question for you. Probably not every one of you will answer yes. Have any of you, raise your right hand if this is true, have any of you ever gone fishing? Just a few, right? Do you like it? Do you, ca you catch anything? Yes. Yeah. Who taught you how to fish? My mom. Your mom, huh? Nice, Matt. Hmm? The mom taught. <laughs> oh, oh, there's a yes. God um, gives us joy. God does give us joy. Yes, you are right. God gives us joy. You're darn tootin' he does. I have another question for you. This one I'm sure all of you will answer. How many of you eat breakfast? All right. Do you like breakfast? You didn't have breakfast today? Well, okay, maybe later on you'll make up for it. But breakfast is fun, right? Right? Do you know, what do you usually have for breakfast? Um, Just one thing. Waffles. Waffles. Cereal. Cereal? What else? Bacon. Bacon. That's really good. How about you? Cheerios. Cheerios, very nice. Nice Cheerios, good for your heart, right? Eggs. 
Eggs, that's my favorite. Pancakes. Pancakes. Blueberries. Blueberries, very healthy, very healthy with the Cheerios, very nice. Well, do you ever have fish for breakfast? No. no. Hi, come on and join us. No, well, you know, back when Jesus was walking on the earth, they used to eat fish all the time. And all of his friends, you know, the disciples, they were fishermen. Well, what did we celebrate a few weeks ago? Do you remember? On March, two weeks ago. Jesus ruled for the death. What? Jesus ruled for death. Ah, that's right. Jesus rose from the death. I'm sorry. I'm getting a little hard of hearing. And another name for that is? Easter. Easter. We celebrated Jesus rose from the dead. And the third day after he died, he rose again. Jesus died on the cross. Yes, he did. He died on the cross, and then he was raised from the death. And we who know him will be raised up too. That's the beauty of Easter. So after he died and after he rose from the dead, he started showing up. And one of the places he showed up was on the shore, on the beach, when all of his followers were fishing and he helped them catch fish when they didn't. And you know what he said to them when they finally, one of them recognized him? He said, come on, come on down, and let's eat. Anybody? Fish. Let's eat fish. Let's eat breakfast. And that's what he did. So Jesus rose, and he rose from the dead, and he appeared to all of his friends, and he made them breakfast. And you know what? He fed them food, but he feeds us something better. You know what he feeds us with? His love. And that's something that you never get hungry again for. Because once you have the love of Jesus inside you, you're going to be happy all the time. Even though you might frown sometimes, you're going to be totally joyful. Because he's our Lord. He's our Savior. And he loves you so much. Why do you think he loves you so much? Because you're real good looking? Is that why? Why does Jesus love you? Because you're real smart? Because his son died and rose, and God the Father said, from now on, anyone who knows Jesus is my son and daughter. So you've all been adopted. Even though you have your own parents, your own grandparents, your own guardians, you all have been adopted by God. And the day has come, and it will come again when Jesus says, let me feed you. Let me feed you. Okay? So now we're going to say a little prayer, and then we are going to go to your kids' church where the wonderful adults will teach you more about Jesus. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, bless these children. Heavenly Father, please, we ask you to just let the Spirit fill up all the teachers from our kids' church so that all these beautiful faces, these beautiful minds, these beautiful young people will be filled with your Spirit and we'll just know that God loves them as he loves us. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right, head on off to Kids Church, please.
He's pretty good at that, isn't he? <laughs> I have a great pleasure today. We have a guest preacher uh, whom I know is a friend and is my brother in Christ. He also, we started a men's ministry retreat after many years of not having it quite a few years ago. And our very first teacher and leader of that men's retreat was this, this holy, wonderful man. He's here today with his uh, beloved wife and who keeps him out of trouble, Lisa, right? That's what he told me. Um, and he's not only the first person who led our men's ministry here, uh, he's preached here before, and every time I've heard him speak, both at that retreat and here, uh, the Holy Spirit is, always shows up, and so the Holy Spirit will show up today. I'm talking about Pastor Douglas Adams, um, he is the senior pastor of the Joy Church of God in West Orange. Let's give him a Brookdale welcome. <laughs> pastor Doug. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Come on, let's give your praise and worship team a hand of appreciation. Now, I, I think it's worthy of appreciation for a couple of reasons. Um, not the least of which is I can't do it. So um, it's good to see uh, Pastor Love there. Um, he always gets on my nerves because he does not age. I just want you to know. I know the Bible says that he'll bless us with long life, but come on, ain't that ridiculous? It, it, it's probably been almost 20 years, and the dude is still trying to get old enough to get his driver's license. I, I just, I, I'm jacked up right now. Um, just love, 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 love Brookdale, uh, love Brookdale Baptist, love Brookdale community, love Brookdale folk. Um, we got introduced to your ministry some years ago um, when my family had an opportunity, my wife and I, uh, came to a concert um, that you had with Larnell Harris here. And uh, I can remember he was sharing about his wife who, or his daughter who was at the University of Texas uh, as a basketball player. So, you know, back then you couldn't Google, so you had to go and figure out, you know, because I got to figure out what's going on. And, and um, I'm only saying that because at my age to still be able to remember things is, is like doing praise and worship. Okay, every time you remember something, it's praise and worship to God. And I'm thankful to him for that. How many of you are thankful to God because he's just glorious? He's, he's just a good God. I mean, and, and not just, you know, like good chocolate cake can be good sometimes. I'm talking about that really, 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 really good you know, made by that sister in the church that everybody knows that they know when she's baking, none of the other women in the church bake good. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about that kind of good God. And I'm just so grateful, grateful to have my wife here. You know, over the years, um, I've had a chance to engage with your beloved, wonderful pastor in so many ways. He's just such a sweet man of God. He has just such a wonderful spirit about him, and he has a wonderful story, which I'm sure all of you know, and just forgive me if I tap into that today as we go into the message. I titled the message today, What Now? And the scripture that the Lord put on my heart is John uh, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Now, I choose to use the English Standard Version. It is a literal translation. It's not a paraphrase. And so you will find direct reference to it in the King James Version. Uh, I only say that for the comfort of those who really it's important for them to know that. Um, and the Word of God reads as follows. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the 
two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, ooh, Lord have mercy. It's a good thing that brother got off the organ, because if he was still on the organ, I might have to go Pentecostal on y'all about what happens when just when the day starts breaking. I don't know if you've ever had some long sleepless nights where you've been worried and you've been struggling. Maybe your finances have been challenged. Maybe your relationships have been challenged. I'm a grandfather now. Maybe your children or your children's children have been facing some dynamics in this life. But my Bible always tells me weeping may endure for the night, but all oh, just as the day is breaking, joy comes in the morning. It's important for us to understand that as the day, it says, just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Woo, I'm just going to help some parents today. Every now and then, we need to stop being philosophical and psychological and just look our children in the eye and say, go to the right side of the boat. There's a time when the body of Christ needs to understand and know that we have to go to the right side of the issue. We got to look to the right side of the conversation. We got to be on the right side of the debate. Let everybody else, as Joshua said, do as you see fit. But as for me and my house, we're going to be on the right side of the boat. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. The, that disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, I, I just love how John takes the liberty to assume that we know he's talking about himself every time he says the disciple that Jesus has loved. Now, you need to understand, some of you may not know me, you may not have been here when I've been here before, but I'm from Detroit, and us folk from Detroit, we got issues, right? And some of our issues are like John. John takes it very personal. I don't know if y'all know how God feels about you. I don't know if you know how Jesus feels about you. But ask me, I'm the one that Jesus loves. Now, he may love all the rest of y'all, but in my mess and in my struggle, I need to know that Jesus loves me personally. And he goes to Peter and he says, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he therefore said to he uh, uh, he therefore put out his outer garment, which he was stripped for work, or which he had taken off for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came and came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land. But about a hundred yards off, when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon went aboard and hauled the net of the fish that he you had, uh, I'm sorry, a shore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. I'm going to come back to that. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to 
the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Father God, I thank you and praise you for this moment. Lord, I thank you for this moment in your earthly kingdom history. But I also understand for you this moment is not bound or limited to time. I know because you are a God that is beyond time, you have been waiting, you have structured, you have strategically planned and set up this moment before the beginning of time. Just as you curate all of our journeys, just as you structure our paths, just as you order the steps of the righteous, you have been leading us to this moment. And I pray that I first, but everyone that's under the sounds of my voice would surrender ourselves to your will and to the leadership of your Holy Spirit as we discover what your heart is crying out to us to say in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. So if I were to give you a key biblical truth or something to hold on to or frame this message with, it would, start, it would simply be this. Jesus still shows up. And I think that it's really important in the time that we're in, it's really important in the face of the contemporary news conversations that are going on today for us to remember that Jesus still shows up. Our Bible tells us that in the last day there will be wars and rumors of wars, and all of that is a prelude to the moment where the Bible promises that Jesus will show up. But I'm here to tell you that in two weeks, we see the eastern sky break until we hear the trump sound, until that glorious return. Know that Jesus is still showing up in your context. I find it interesting. I didn't get to watch uh, much or any of March Madness this year, which is really difficult for me because I love basketball, I love sports, but I, I really didn't get to see any of it. I just kind of got to hear uh, little sound bites about it, and and it, it's still I still find it very interesting that UConn uh, had a repeat per performance, right? That they were able to just win the championship again, right? And, and, and it seems like it's an insignificant issue or reality unless you're in the context and know how many young men start as young boys working and dribbling and sweating and playing in leagues and coaches start coaching little kids and they coach their way up and all of the energy and all of the money and I'm so glad that I grew up and I was a parent when I was a parent because I just went to Kmart and got my son's shoes. He wasn't getting paid, so there was no reason for me to have to pay all that money to put shoes on that boy. He was going to grow out of them anyway. But it's a different world for y'all. I understand. I'm at this point in life where I enjoy my senior discounts. I can't wait till they come up with a senior discount for the Jordans. Then my feet are going to be lit or fit, or whatever the contemporary terminology would be for me to have cool tennis shoes. But so much has to go into that process of trying to repeat a glorious moment. And, and I can tell you just from my own context, there are my guys, the Michigan Wolverines. It's great to be a Michigan Wolverine. You know, we struggle for three years. We just fought, and the first time we went, and then we got beat, and people got hurt, and it was just so bad, and we didn't win. And then the next time we were supposed to win, and them jokers from Texas. You know, I read an article somewhere where they were talking about some folk where the, the Russians were talking about how Texas should succeed from the union. I don't think the state should leave, but those football teams down there, they can go somewhere else when they're playing again. You know, I'm sorry, I, you know, help me, I got issues. You know, when I, but I, when I think about it, I listen to the narrative and the mindset now that they've won. And after they won, they lost, and they're going to lose so many players to the NFL. And their coach who had been with them for so long and built this championship culture and everything, he's gone. 
what does it take for them to develop the mindset to come into this year and not just give it up, not just acquiesce? What do we do now? What does a team do when the whole purpose of playing a sport is to win games and win the championship? After you won the championship, are you still expected to win the championship? And I hear some of the Michigan fans talk about, well, you know, this year we're going to be rebuilding and everything else like that. I'm from Detroit. Why go through all that if you don't plan on winning? I ain't trying to say nothing, but you might want to hold on to the fact that I'm trying to get to the point today that the Bible is telling you why go through all of this in Christ if you don't plan on winning. And I really do believe that the Word of God is telling us something, and I share this with my church uh, often when we're talking about these what now moments. As a matter of fact, I submit that as believers, we are most vulnerable for attack before or after a blessing. The enemy comes to try and disrupt, distract, and despair us. Why? Because he doesn't want us to be in a position to receive God's blessing. So when things go good and, and life is great and we have this wonderful time with God and we just experience God and there's some folk who have received the Lord and they're going to be coming to the baptism class and they're going to get immersed, they're going to be dunked. You know, they, we, they, we, they, this, this is how I love this stuff, see, because Christians, we're just off the hook. We're not just trying to sprinkle, get a little spray gun, squirt them down, get a little refreshing, you know what I'm talking about? You know, we want to dunk them down deep in the water and you know some of the folk that Pastor Jim if he was from Detroit that he knew that their journey was a little bit longer right it took a little bit more for them to get to this point he might dip them and hold them down there for a while hold it hold I had, uh, my aunt gets dialysis and sometimes he leaks afterwards and he got some blood on one of his jackets and this morning I was soaking it in peroxide and cold water to get the blood out. You know, sometimes those, those deep ingrained dirty sins take a little bit more to get out. And so, you know, as we look at this, I want us to understand that in our text today, we find that Jesus is, is coming to his core team because they are living through a what now moment. They've seen his glorious resurrection. I mean, that, if that's not enough to blow your mind, I mean, oh. And then they see him again afterward. Pastor Jim preached about seeing them, them seeing him on the road of Emmaus. And, and this is the interesting thing. You know, they didn't recognize him then. I'm just going to tell you something. I can forget people's faces. But if I go to your funeral and I see you at Starbucks, I'm going to recognize you, okay? And so there's three things that I really want us to grab onto and to try and hold on to in this text. And the first thing is, is that he reveals himself to us again. It doesn't matter how many times you've seen him. It doesn't matter how much he's done for you. It is so it is so much his intent to make sure that you know, that you know, that you know, that you know he's going to show up, he's going to show up, he's going to show up, he's going to show up. It does not matter where you're at. It doesn't matter how difficult it is. He is going to show up. I think about the story of Joseph, and Joseph ended up in a few bad places on the way to a good place. And the Bible tells us that all throughout that story that it, it would just stand out in the text and God was with him 
and God was with him, and God was with him, and God was with him. Jesus himself says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So the text starts out saying that Jesus is coming to them again. It is really significant for us to know that God is very intentional in his word in sending the message that, baby, I'm here. I am going to show up. It's not that God wasn't there. This says something different about the omnipresence of God. This is speaking about a God who is not only going to be there, but he is going to reveal himself to you. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're going through. But God is going to reveal himself to you. Oh, what would happen if the body of Christ stopped being so attracted to sound bites and news clips and just started looking to see where God's going to show up at? You see, when I was a young man, I met my wife in California. She's a native San Diegan. There's not very many native Californians really in the world. Most of them were transplants. And so we lived there. We lived in Long Beach. We were Christians. We're going to church. We had our young son, Doug. I was, she was gone to work, and I was going to preparing to take him to the daycare, and then I was going to go to work. And then all of a sudden, the, the apartment building, you know, it started rumbling. And we had some young couples that lived up on the, the level up above us, right? And the stairs were outside. So they coming down so hard. I'm thinking, these jokers coming out of their place. They all loud. They shaking my house. Now, I just want y'all to know, I, I was in the first quarter of my salvation. It wasn't the second half yet. I hadn't had halftime, right? I just want y'all to know, right? And so I came outside trying to figure out, why they, how are they going to be walking? And I'm looking around for them, you know. You know how sometimes we're always looking for somebody to blame. And I'm looking to find these jokers, and there was nobody there. So I thought, okay, they must have went on out. I got to get Doug. He's in the apartment. I go back, and I go to finish up and pack Doug up. And do you know the next thing that happened? The house starts shaking again. This time it was really shaking. And I'm a little slow on the uptake. And then I realized, oh, my God, it's an earthquake. So I grab my son, tuck him up under my arm, and I run outside. And I'm standing outside, and the, there's a pool in the jacuzzi. So I turn this way, and the water's jumping up out the pool. So I turn this way, and the water's jumping out the jacuzzi. And I look like a cartoon character. And then it hit me. Oh, my God, where do you run when the earth is shaking? And many times, that's how we are in the situations of our lives. We are often looking for people to blame or for people to rescue us when we really need to be looking for God, knowing that he will show up. The second thing I need you to understand about this text is that when God shows up, God has a plan for your what now moment. Jesus showed up on the shore, and he's like, look out the right side of the boat. Now, I want you to understand something. Sometimes we end up in what now moments because in between the glorious moments, you know, the Bible says that God will take us from glory to glory to glory. And it's so sweet and serene to think about the glory and the glory. But, oh, Lord, in between the glory. And many times, we will just go back to our default. We'll go back to our comfortable places. We'll go back to our habits. We, we'll try to do the right thing. We'll try and do the new thing. We'll try and go the no, new way. We'll try and be open to God revealing himself in a different way. But when we don't feel that glorious moment, you know when we're in that space where there's no new prophecy between the Old Testament, our historical experience with God, and the promise of a new revelation with God, we will just go back to what we were doing no mistake that it's Peter and Thomas that are part of this moment. And they just go right back to doing what they used to do. And guess what? 
based upon my Bible, they went to do what they used to do, and they got exactly the same results that they used to get. This wasn't a new place where Christ found them, doing everything in their human power to be significant and pulling up empty nets. And Jesus showed up again. Just because you fell off, just because you struggled, just because you had moments of doubt, just because you stumbled, it doesn't mean that Jesus will not show up and give you new direction. The Bible says that he showed up and he redirected them again. And what that tells me is that no matter what your right now moment is, even if your what now moment is based upon what you did in the past and you're going back and you're replaying the same old song over and over like a scratch record, Jesus will still show up and give you a plan forward. He said, put it out on the right side of the boat. If we will just stop and look to Jesus. Doesn't the Bible say looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? So he told him, put it out on the right side of the boat. And you know, John, John was quick with this because he had this kind of close, intimate thing. You know, folk try and play John out, but there's something special about being intimate with Jesus. There's a reason why we need Bible study. There's a reason why we need Sunday school. There's a reason why we need children's church. There's a reason why we should read our word daily. There's a reason why we should stop throughout the day and just stop and praise God and spend time with God. Because intimacy with Christ expedites our recognition of Christ. The more you know something, listen, I know my children, I know my grandchildren. I can see them jokers way off, and I know that the, they're my they walk like they're mine. They act like they're mine. Sometimes I have to close my eyes. But I know that they're mine because I have an intimate relationship with them. John has an intimate relationship with Christ. So he immediately says, everybody else on the boat may have been where they were going to be. Peter of all folks should have. But John loved is the benchmark of our relationship with Christ. Yeah, I did that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you know, he's over there. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. You, you guys got me in that with that name, you know. And so finally, Jesus tells them to put it out. They come in. Peter puts his clothes on to go swimming. You know, it, it's interesting. We are definitely not in the Bible days. In these days, whenever anybody gets around open water, they're taking clothes off. I never understood that. I don't know what it is about water that makes people think that naked is the right choice. It just happens. They get around water. They just start throwing clothes over everywhere. I don't even mess around with the ocean. Don't like pools. Love all y'all. Don't want to take a bath with any of you. You understand what I'm saying? I got issues. I'm from Detroit. Peter might have been from Detroit, because what does he do? He puts more clothes on and jumps in the water. And when they get there, Jesus already has breakfast cooked for them. This third point, the, the first one is Jesus reveals himself to us again. The second one is Jesus redirects us again. But the third one is this, that he replenishes us again. Before they even got to the shore, they had just got the fish caught and breakfast was ready. My wife and I did this all night prayer thing on Friday night into Saturday morning. And I'm just going to tell you, we wore out. We're at that age where we think more about what the the uh, uh, Congress is doing with Medicaid and Medicare, then we think about what they're doing with the defense budget. I just want you to know that's where we're at right now. And so she's like, she's sure we're going to go and get some sleep. I told her, listen, I need to get me some food. I done been up all night. I need to put something in my stomach and I got to eat. And you know, you go to the restaurant that early in the morning. If they're open, they're not ready. Jesus is always ready. 
It doesn't matter what moment or time in your life you have your daybreak. Jesus is there with whatever you need. He has the provisions for your what now moment already ready. Baby, it's already cooked up. The charcoal is hot. The fish is sizzling. He's got the bread right there. I don't know if y'all know this, but Jesus has a tendency to have some fish and, a br and some bread whenever you need it. They thought they needed to go fishing. Jesus is telling them, you don't need to go catch fish, baby. I already got the fish. I didn't call you to catch fish. I stopped you from catching fish because I can do fish. I left you here to catch something else. And so he says, bring, come on, bring some of the fish that you got. It's okay. Why? Because God always wants to partner us in so that we have a sense of intimate cooperation and partnership with God. When Jesus said, bring some of your fish, I guarantee you, I just want y'all to know, my dad was a chef. The fish that Jesus caught and was cooking up was better than any fish they could bring up there. It's not that God needs your gifts. It's not that God needs your talent. It's that God needs you to know that he loves you so much, he wants you to experience what it's like to bring something to the table. It's time for the body of Christ to move away from this consumer TV mentality about our faith and get back to contributing to the kingdom of God. Jesus gives you gifts for the sake of the kingdom. Yes, go out there and use your gifts and make some money. Please, please go out there and make some money. So you can pay your tithe and offering. Bring it to the storehouse. Please. The Bible says if a man, and you know we're in the, the 2000s, or a woman, doesn't work, she shouldn't eat. Now, I know that's tough for some of us old school guys. My mom worked three jobs. She don't never have to work again. My wife, she never had to work if she don't want to. If she want to, I can't stop her because she's tougher than I am. But I, so I'm not trying to be all that new age. Uh, you know, I'm just, that's not, I'm an old school dude. But I'm just saying, this whole thing about contribution, Jesus specifically says, bring some of what you got. Not because I need it, but because you need to experience what it means to see what I can do with what you bring. He has the provisions for our what now moments. And so as I close and just try and wrap my mind around this devotional experience we're having here together, then the question becomes, we understand that Jesus shows up again and again and again. Jesus will redirect again and again and again. And Jesus will replenish us again and again and again. Let's give Jesus a hand clap of appreciation for what he does for us again and again and again. But there's a final part to this story in John 21, 15 through 17, where Jesus then goes and has a specific conversation with Peter. I'm not your pastor. I won't have to counsel some of you guys through what uh, the visiting speaker is about to say. Excuse me. I will send you a first aid kit with some bandages and stuff. Uh, later you'll get that in the mail. But one of the things that we need to understand in the body of Christ today is all of us got a little bit of Peter in us. All of us got a little bit of we think we know what we think we know. All of us got a little bit in us where we'll cut somebody's ear off if they get on the wrong side of us. How do I know this? I drive on the parkway and the freeway in New Jersey. And what we need to understand about this is that at some point or another, God loves us enough to show us the Peter in our hearts. 
and we have to then decide what now. Peter chose to go back and go fishing. It wasn't that he stopped loving Jesus. When he heard that it was Jesus, he's old, he can't see. He was the old man that got to the tomb last. And then the Bible says that brother jumped out of the boat and swam. It might have been about 100 yards out. I have to stop and do an inhaler if I have to walk up. No, I'm sorry, that's not true. Uh, forgive me, I just wanted to make some other folk feel better about their physical condition. Peter loved Jesus, but it didn't stop him from getting distracted in his what now moment. But Jesus came to him specifically after he had fed them, after he had provisioned them. You know, sometimes when God wants to use us to restore somebody, we need to replenish them first. We need to feed them the loving word of God first. We always want people to change first. No, trust me. Didn't happen for me, saying that to make all y'all feel better. Jesus fed them, and then he went to Peter. And he asked him the three famous questions we know. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And you've all heard this preach before. If you haven't, you will. Just stay here long enough, and Pastor Jim gets to the entire rightly divided word. You can trust him. But he keeps asking him this, and he, and he comes to him and says, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. He keeps coming to this thing. And this is really a, a really critical transitional moment because what did Jesus say to him at first? Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It's this whole evangelistic zeal about getting out there and catching the folk. The problem is we as the church, we stopped at that place. We're doing everything to be, we can to be attractive. We can, we're doing everything we can to fill these big glorious buildings and do all of this stuff. But the last time I checked, the Great Commission said, make disciples. When Jesus comes to Peter this time, he's very clear Dude, I need you to feed my sheep. I need you to nourish my disciples. I need you to build folk up. I need you to prepare them for the what now moments in their lives. You know why? Because when a lost, distracted, and sinful world sees a true believer in Jesus Christ loving people who don't deserve to be loved, Having joy when there's no reason to even be happy. They begin to think, there's something different about that person that I need to find out about. You've all seen it. On your jobs, when stuff is going on and you find Christ in the midst of chaos in that moment, there are people that come to you, they test you out. Well, what do you think about this? Well, what do you think about this? When stuff's going on politically, they'll run to you. Well, what do you think about this? Well, who are you voting for? Well, what's going on here? Well, what's going on there? Maybe I'm voting for Jesus. I'm sorry, you didn't see him on the ballot? I'm closing. The devotional moment for us today is that he repurposes us again. He has a purpose for you in the what now moment that you're in right now in your life. And my question to you is what are you willing to do to discover him? He's on the shore. He's right there. He's showing himself. He's calling out to you. He's giving you direction. He has replenishment for you. He has the provision you need to respond in your what now moment because he has a purpose for you. 
Brookdale, you've been here since the dinosaurs. But God still has a purpose for you. Jesus is still showing up at Brookdale Community Church. He still is bringing provision to this church. And he has a purpose for this church. Don't grow weary in well-doing. God has a purpose for you. The kingdom work is not done. There are still people who need to know God through hymns. There are still people who need to know God through orthodox, traditional, grounded, biblical truth. There are people who need to see their children up on the pulpit and the pastor having a pastoral talk with them on the pulpit. God is not changing his heart towards Brookdale. He is simply calling us to see Jesus. To see Jesus on the shores of our what now moment. And whether we jump in the water or row our happy selves over there. Today, I just want to encourage you in the what now moment of your life, your family, this church and this community, whatever you got to do, just get to the shore and get to Jesus. God bless you and greet each other. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Wow, that was, that was powerful. How many of you uh, appreciate Pastor Doug and his ministry today? Thank you so much, Pastor. We're so grateful. And you know what? We really need to re realize that being a Christian is not a spectator event, right? It's about being in there. And so we're going to sing a song, uh, a, a familiar hymn if you grew up in the church. And I invite you to turn to 597 in your hymn books, 597. And we're going to stand and we're going to sing as a as a, a song of consecration to our hearts to, to take what the Lord has brought to Pastor Doug's heart and what he's preached to us. And we're going to sing verses 1, 5, and 6 of Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated. Let's sing together. This is not a biblical term, 
Wow. Wasn't, aren't you blessed? Are we blessed today by my friend, Pastor? Thank you, Pastor Doug. Thank you. Thank you. That was a powerful message. The Holy Spirit did show up. I'm sure you all saw him. Right? That's right. Um, I was going to close in prayer, and I didn't ask you this, so I'm going to impose on you. I'm just so overwhelmed by his message today, I would like to ask my friend, Pastor Father God, Lord, we come before you humble, Lord, broken and with a limp. But we know that you will take the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. We know, Lord, that it's not our perfection or our expertise that you desire, but a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. There are hurting souls and families in our churches, and in our community, and you have saw fit to keep your anointing, your loving, guiding hand upon this congregation, upon this community of people, upon this beloved and blessed pastor. And so I pray, Father God, that you would make Jesus unmistakably apparent in every conversation they have, every decision they need to make, every household that's represented here, and every soul that they encounter, that the world will know that you sent him and that we are his very own. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you all. Come next week. And remember, we worship a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. Look what he said to Peter. Peter, who betrayed him. Peter, who said, I don't know this man, but God knew him. Jesus know, knew him, and Jesus knows all of us. So let's get out of the boat, splash our way to see him, and he's going to feed us, not just with fish, not just on that anthracite little stove he has. He's going to feed us with his love. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. And God bless all of you. See you next week. God bless you.